Yeah, good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming this early Sunday morning. It's a great pleasure that you're having me here today at DLD. We had a wonderful day yesterday and also a wonderful evening and a great opening which already touched upon quantum computing. So quantum computing, a fascinating new technology. It's a new paradigm of computing. And quantum computers are fundamentally different to classical computers. Why this is the case and what you can do with them and what you will be doing with them in the future, I would like to talk today. So quantum computers, actually classical computers, as you know, they can do a lot of different things. They're very powerful today. We have just, in the middle of last year, delivered the largest the world's largest and world's fastest supercomputer, so-called Summit. It can do mathematical calculations at 200 quadrillion per second, 200 petaflops. That's a very powerful machine. However, there are also limits. Let's have a look at an example. You all know what coffee is. You may have just had one a couple of minutes ago, and you're waiting for the caffeine to kick in. Caffeine, you see the molecular structure here. It's a moderately sized molecule. It consists of a number of different atoms, like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen. Caffeine, the molecule, is more complex than water, but much less complex than DNA. So let's assume we want to calculate the internal energy spectrum, the internal structure, the reactivity, in order to understand how it reacts and how it stimulates our body. The complexity involved with this molecule goes beyond the capabilities of being simulated with supercomputers today, or even with computers we can build in the future you need 10 to the 48 classical bits. So if you calculate this mass, then it would be the tenth of the planet Earth. So you can imagine this is beyond the capabilities of really exactly calculating the prop, building a machine which can exactly calculate the properties of caffeine. So supercomputers are limited to calculate this. So why is the reason? This is because the molecule is governed by the laws of quantum physics. It has about 102 electrons, and all these electrons interact with each other and influence the movement of all the different electrons. So this is a so-called um, many-body problem, and its complexity increases with size exponentially. So, what are we doing with this? So we see supercomputers are limited, so we need, need a new type of computers. And Richard Feynman, you know him all, a very smart physicist, came up with a really beautiful idea. He said, if you want to simulate nature, you better do it with quantum computers. So he said at a, a conference in 1981, where quantum computers were actually the first time mentioned by him, he said, I'm not happy with all the analysis that go with just the classical theory, because nature isn't classical. Damn it. And if you want to make a simulation of nature, you'd better make it quantum mechanical. So this was 1981, and since then, a lot of research and development has gone into quantum computing, first from the theoretical side, and now since 20 years also from the experimental side. So today, we have quantum computing. It's here. It's no longer only in the realm of science fiction. We have built and did a lot of research, fundamental research, over the last 20 years, and today we have existing and working quantum computers in our lab, and actually not only in our lab, because just about two weeks ago, we announced at the Computer Electronics Show that we have the first um, IBM Q System 1 standing in one of our data centers. So what you see here is actually a beautiful picture. It's almost like art. So it fits with the motto of this conference also. And you see here the interior of the quantum computer. 
you see at the very bottom a canister of metal where the quantum processor is housed inside, and you send, see these uh, metal lines going down. These are superconducting um, micro um, coax cables where actually the information from the outside goes into the um, quantum processor uh, by using microwave pulses. So you control and bring in the information and take out the information into the quantum processor from the outside world via microwave pulses. So at the very bottom, if you close the housing, as I will show you later, you have about 15 millikelvin. This, this is minus 273.00 degrees Celsius, which means it's really super cold. It's actually 100 times colder than outer space. And it's also dark. Why? Because the quantum states are very fragile, they are very delicate, and we have to shield them from the surrounding, which is very noisy, where we have temperature, where we have light, where we have, um, you know, a lot of vibrations, which actually can kill the quantum state. So we have to keep it dark and cold. So here you see the quantum processor. Uh, we designed and built those at our labs um, in Yorktown and in Zurich. And uh, what you see are these squares, and these squares are actually the um, quantum, and the quantum um, bits, and around these weekly lines are the uh, microwave resonators, uh, which are used in order to talk with the quantum bits. So in our implementation of a quantum computer, we are using superconducting qubits. So we are using two superconducting metals and an insulator in between as a carrier of the quantum information. And as I mentioned, we can talk to them by using microwave resonators. So the qubit actually behaves like an artificial um, atom. And so let's, let's look a bit at what is different to a classical computer. You know all cl classical computers, and you all know that we are using bits for the calculation with classical computers. And a bit, a classical bit, can actually have two states. It can be in the zero or it can be a one, nothing in between. And so we represent information by a sequence of bits and then we use these bits for calculation and we exactly know whether during the calculation a bit is a one or a zero. In a quantum computer this is different. We are using quantum bits and a quantum bit can be a one, a zero, or a zero and a one at the same time. And this is represented by the sphere which you see here on the right-hand side. So in a classical way, the bit let's represent it by an arrow up and an arrow down for zero and one. And in a qubit, you can then actually represent all the points at the surface of this sphere which is shown by a superposition of the zero and one. So you have a much richer space in quantum computing. So the phenomenon I just described is so-called su superposition. And another interesting phenomenon which is used for quantum computing is entanglement. And entanglement is a very strange behavior. It's nothing what we can experience in the classical world. And um, the two states are actually inextricably connected and linked with each other to quantum states. We can link them very tightly together. What does it mean? They're correlated, so if we take them together, we entangle them, and then we separate it to the end of the uh, universe, then they actually, if we influence one, we influence the other one at the same time. And so these two phenomena, superposition and entanglement, give us the power of exponentials for the performance of quantum computers. So exponential scaling is really what's the trick here for quantum computers. And it's hard to imagine. We all think we know what it is, but it's really hard to imagine. So I would like to illustrate it by an example. And uh, there is kind of a famous story where there was this very smart guy. He invented the game of uh, chess. And so he went, he went to his emperor and he offered chess as a present to the emperor. The emperor was delighted by this very entertaining and intelligent game, and he offered in reverse a wish to the um, inventor of the game. 
So this very smart gay guy had a very humble desire. So he wished that he got from the emperor one grain of rice for the first square of the checkerboard, then double the amount for the second um, checker, um, um, square, and again double it for the next one and going so on. So you will see what happened. So on the first day, he get one grain of rice. The second day, he get two grains of rice. The third day, he get four grains of rice, not even a meal. So after a week, he actually had 127 grains of rice. And after one month, it actually piled up quite a bit already. So he had almost 270,000 grains of rice. So you see already here the exponential scale. I mean, this is rice he cannot eat during his lifetime. So after 64 days, when the checkerboard was gone, you end up with 461 billion metric tons of rice. And this is 1,000 times the amount of rice we actually produce in the world today. So this is the power of exponentials. And this is what quantum computers use for the performance. So the performance of quantum computers increases exponentially by 2 to the power of n, where n is the number of qubits. What does it mean? So let's compare it to a classical computer. A classical computer, today we have about 10 billions of transistors in one of the microprocessors. So if you add one transistor, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't change your performance. Only if you double the number of transistors, then you double the performance. In a quantum computer, however, if you add one additional qubit, you double the performance of the computer. So that's the difference. So here you see a, a quick animation of how does it look like. You have um, classical computers, an input to the quantum computer. In the middle, you have the electronic rack, which creates the microwave pulses. And on the right-hand side, you have the cryostat with the, microprocessor in, uh, with the quantum processor inside. So you can bring your signals into the quantum processor. Uh, and this is actually then first you um, define the state of the different qubits. Uh, you tell the electronics um, how it has to bring the microwave pulses into the machine. Um, then the uh, microwave resonators actually talk to the quantum bits. These are the squares. And then they read out the quantum bits again. The information flows back. And um, then by the electronics kind of transformed again into a classical output. So this is how it works today in, uh, in the labs in a quantum computer. So what type of problems can we solve with it? And quantum computers are really bu uh, built for difficult problems, for problems classical computers have a hard time to solve. And uh, easy problems for a classical computer are, for example, multiplications. But a very tough one is, for example, factorization or very complex optimization problems. So quantum computers are actually good if you need for your problem exponentially increasing resources with a problem size. And some of those um, problems are, for example, quantum simulations, which I mentioned at the beginning, but also combinatorial optimization problems or algebraic algorithms. And uh, in the simulating, so we are actually starting to really apply the quantum computers which we have built to solve problems. And this is an example to find algorithms for calculating quantum chemistry, for calculating molecules, which we have published last year. And uh, in this case, you actually use a quantum computer to find the minimum state, the minimum energy state. And we have started with um, hydrogen molecule, lithium hydride in the middle, and also beryllium dihydride. Another problem which, we're, which we are working on is uh, machine learning or classification problems for binary classification. And another one is also in the area of uh, risk management, optimization problems, where you are looking for uh, the cost um, function to, re to minimize the cost function problem. Uh, one of the things, as I mentioned, qu the quantum information is very delicate. So it can happen that there are also noise in the system which may influence the calculation. And this creates errors. And today, the quantum computers are not fully error-corrected as our classical machines are. 
So we are working on error mitigation in order to understand which errors happen and then um, you know, kind of reduce the errors or mitigate for the errors which happened during the calculation. And you see here in this example that we made quite some progress in this also of last year. On the left-hand side, you see actually the calculation where you still have errors in the quantum computer. And uh, then on the right-hand side, you see then the red dots are actually the ones where the error is mitigated, and they are exactly right with the exact calculation. So another problem class, as I mentioned, is in the area of uh, classification, machine learning. So you want to classify uh, the two data sets, and this is, um, for example, important for applications in the area of customer segmentation or image classification. And the idea is you want to classify the yellow dots and the blue dots, you want to separate them, and you want to find the boundaries between them. And here it's very easy, you, it's, a square, uh, it's, a, it's a linear, and you can linearly separate the blue dots and the yellow dots. However, often the data may not be linearly separable as is shown in this example. So what do you do? Actually, you can now use um, quantum mechanics and you can go up in a higher dimensional space and then you are able to actually separate the blue dots and the yellow dots. So these are examples which show that we can use the power of, of uh, quantum computers for solving those problems. And today these problems are kind of still smaller and we are trying and experiencing and learning and developing algorithm to solve more complex problems. So it's a very exciting time. Another example is here that we really demonstrated recently the uh, quantum advantage. And this was actually done with a colleague here at the Technical University in Munich where we demonstrated that we have can prove a quantum advantage with shallow circuits. That's very important because it shows that even for shallow quantum circuits, this means where the number of calculations in, you can do on a quantum computer is limited, you have an a clear advantage compared to classical systems. So there is certain linear algebra problems where using a quantum computer, the number of steps is independent of the problem size whereas in classical computers, the number of steps grows logarithmically with the size. That was actually a very important proof which we were able to do last year. And so therefore, quantum computers are here, they're existing in the labs and even in the data centers and are used. And um, I wanted to highlight, and perhaps a question, when do you think that a quantum computer is available to you personally? Some Next year. Okay, so it's actually already available since May 2016. So we have in May 2016, we have launched the quantum experience and we have made available a five qubit quantum processor through the IBM cloud. So you can log in with your mobile phone, with your computer to the IBM cloud and you can access our quantum computer which was sitting at that time in the lab. And since then, we have more than 100,000 users which use our quantum experience, our quantum processor. Uh, there's more than 150 countries and one, more than 6.7 million experiments have already run on the quantum computer. We have upgraded the system from a five qubit quantum processor to a 16 quantum qubit quantum processor. And uh, also the um, academia is actually making heavy use of it. There are more than 130 papers already published by colleagues. And that's very important because we want to use this and open and democratize this quantum computer that everyone has access, that you can learn about quantum computer, that you can get an intu intuition for quantum mechanics, and you can learn, you can use it, you write, can write algorithm, and you can, you can be part of the community. So actually, also in schools and universities, the quantum computer, which we have brought, made open, is used for education and training. So why are free quantum computers in a cloud a big deal? So you can say, oh, five qubits, that's not really a big deal, right? Now we have 16 qubits and you can learn and you can do, but solving really like 
problems um, which you cannot do on a classical computer right now, you can't do with a 16 qubit. We need more qubits to do this. However, what we do is we really accelerated the research. We have more colleagues who have now access to a real quantum computer and not only to simulate quantum computers. Also for education, more and more people are using it for education purposes and get a feeling and an intuition for quantum computing. So everyone has access, try it out, and uh, learn about quantum computing, the new technology which is coming. So one hand, it's the quantum computer. However, it's also important that you can get easy access to it uh, and that not only physicists can work with a quantum computer. Therefore, we are working on a full software stack with a compiler, and we call this Qiskit. Uh, that's an open source quantum information science kit. It can be used by developers, it can be used by everyone, it has different levels of sophistication um, which the, uh, the, the uh, user has to have. And so I want to excite you and I hope you have learned a bit about quantum computing and want to excite you and ask you to join the community to learn about quantum computing. It's coming in the future and there is actually a very active field right now. And so explore the world of quantum and I wanted to add, because I'm here in Munich today, and I'm very proud because we have... Um, actually, it's not clicking anymore. The last side is missing. So I wanted to highlight, uh, which is not showing up now, but we um, have opened the computer, but we are also working in the so-called um, quantum hubs with uh, universities and other partners. And through the quantum hub, the uh, quantum computer is also accessible and um, the Bundeswehr University in Munich is actually one of the quantum hubs. So feel free to reach out to them and also to us to learn more about quantum computing and use the access of a quantum computer which you also have here. And this is actually a 20 qubit quantum computer you have access to. Thank you very much.